ready for the show to begin? Yes. yes. All right. I need to take there. All right. So, hello, Anna there. Don, and I'm your comic show critic, and welcome to the first ever live episode of The Punchline. And not only is it the first ever, ever live episode of The Punchline, not only is this my first ever time at Anna Marathon, it's my first time at a convention go, Jess. ever. So, you know, be nice to the new guy. And since this is my first ever con, I wanted to do something kind of memorable. I wanted to talk about something that I haven't talked before on the show. Something that you guys would remember and not really forget. Redundant as that sounds. So today, I would like to talk about Dick. Tracy. Um, get your minds out of the gut, please. <laughs> yes, ladies and gentlemen, I'm taking a look at another one of the comics pages' most famous adventurers today. I've looked at Flash Gordon before, and we're going back even earlier this time. Dick Tracy was started in 1931 by Chester Gold, which is an awesome sounding name. I like to imagine that Mr. Gold had massive chest hair, an epic mustache, and spent his spare time bench pressing train cars. So basically, this guy. Gold wanted to create a film noir style police detective story, and the world he created was shockingly violent, honestly. It was based on 1930 Chicago, which is also known as Mafia Central. Most of the storylines ended in full-blown shootouts. And it's something I found pretty awesome, because you don't see that level of violence in the comic strips anymore, because they're too scared to show anything violent. <laughs> the main cast naturally includes Dick... No, damn it. Uh, okay. Text? Come here. Yeah, hi. Say hi to everyone at Anna Marathon. But we're in public this time. You cannot pull this kind of stuff here. No. I don't... No, text. You're gonna behave, or I'm gonna turn into Comic Sans, alright? That's what I thought. <laughs> Anyways, aside from classic hero archetype Dick Tracy, the cast of characters included his love interest and eventual wife, Tess Trueheart, and his adopted son, Dick Tracy Jr. The various police officers who served alongside Dick have changed over the years and currently include FBI agent Fritz Dietrich, Sam Catchum, no relation to Ash, and Liz. No last name, just Liz. More famous than the heroes, though, are the villains. Apparently, the strip's villains held just as much appeal as the hero. I can't think of any other franchise that does that. It's honestly a pretty original idea. <laughs> Some of the more famous members of Dick Tracy's rogues gallery included Flat Top, Mole, Broom Face, and holy crap, that's a huge list. <laughs> yeah, this is just from 1960 to 1968. New villains are introduced all the time, so I'm just going to skip over the list, or I'm going to use up all my time that I have allotted here. Chester Gold retired from creating Dick Tracy in 1977, and he handed control over to his assistants Max Allen Collins and Rick Fletcher. Fletcher and Collins were eventually replaced with Dick Wachter and Mike Killian, who were in turn replaced with Joe Staten and Mike Curtis, who are currently the strip's creators. For those of you who haven't seen my show on YouTube before, Handing off a strip from one person to another over the course of several generations qualifies Dick Tracy as what is politely referred to as a legacy strip. I, however, prefer the term zombie strip. Uh... Zombie strips rarely seem to be as good as they were when they were in the hands of the original creator. And that's a fact I've hammered home a number of times, whether it's in Hey the Horrible, BC, Wizard of Rig, Gasoline Alley, the list goes on and on and on. But I believe in giving things a fair shot, especially since the creators of Dick Tracy aren't directly related. It's not a father to something that's happened like with some other comics. That has something that I really, really don't like. So, new villains are being introduced to the strip all the time, as you saw on that massive list earlier. So let's take a look at one of the newest additions to the Dick Tracy Rose Gallery. This is Dick Tracy versus Blackjack. What's that racket? It sounds like tub thumping by Chumbawamba. Ladies and gentlemen, stay calm and we'll be gone soon. This is just an old-fashioned bank robbery. Here, take it. Isn't that your money? Yes. Keep it. I only want the blank, the bank's money. Thank you, everyone. This bank has just been robbed by Blackjack. This is actually a pretty awesome start to the storyline. I'm not going to lie. There's a lot of good detail and style to the artwork, particularly in Blackjack's jawline and his bugged out eyes. And we're getting to see the hints of something complex with this villain, too. 
This could be good. Naturally, Dick Tracy's team is put on the case, and they even have an FBI agent to help them out. This is Fritz and Dietrich's introduction to the strip, for the record. She tells us that Blackjack is sort of a modern-day Robin Hood, robbing only from the corrupt or evil banks and taking extra care to never harm or rob innocent bystanders. And yes, apparently he always plays tub thumping while committing a robbery. <laughs> when the song finishes, so does the robbery. But there's one other detail about this villain that's worth mentioning. He's been a fan of Dick Tracy his whole life, and actually wants to match wits with him. Okay, does anybody else see the logic in this? Because I'm confused. If you're a huge <laughs> fan of someone, wouldn't you want to be like them, not the opposite of them? Let's put it this way. If you're a huge fan of Barack Obama, would you then go and run as the Republican nominee for president against him? <laughs> Blackjack, when are we pulling our next job? All you've been doing is sitting around reading newspapers. Now, Anthony, I've got to find the right place to rob. It must be someplace unpopular with the public. But won't Dick Tracy expect you to do that? That's the idea, Karen. I want Tracy to be there. All my life I've been a Dick Tracy fan. To finally meet him is my ultimate dream. You couldn't just call, ask for a meeting, have an autograph over lunch? The only way you could think of to meet him was to become a wanted criminal? Okay. <laughs> oh, uh, by the way, that honeymoon doll in the bottom row there? Yeah, that's an actual character from the comics history. There was a period of time when Dick Tracy and company routinely went to the moon in a rocket ship and fought space-themed villains. <laughs> honeymoon there? And I swear on Snoopy's flying doghouse, I'm not making this up, is Dick Tracy Jr.'s half-moon alien daughter. Dick Tracy Jr. fell in love with an alien from the moon, married her, and they had a kid together. Dick Tracy's granddaughter is part alien. I couldn't make this stuff up if I tried. <laughs> Back to the story, though. Dick Tracy picks up a lead on a bank that tried and failed to foreclose on an airline company. Naturally figuring that the whole sum bank will be on Blackjack's list, he goes with Fritz and Dietrich to talk to the bank manager. We believe that the bank robber Blackjack has your facility targeted. You know, what makes you think that? This thing's been getting bad press lately. Blackjack looks for that quality in all his targets. I don't have to listen to this. I think our business here is finished. Mr. Wormsworth, what would your superior say if your bank were robbed and they found out you turned down the assistance of the FBI? What do you mean from me? <laughs> Worst bank president ever. Seriously, it's no wonder that this guy's bank has such bad press. He's more cartoonishly evil than the actual villain of the story. Also, this is our first look at Dick Tracy's famous banana yellow trench coat. He's also got a hat to go with it too, which he apparently gets shot off his head a lot. I mean, he's got a wall full of shot hats like on a pegboard. He's got enough hats there to fill an entire wall full of things. I just hope he gets a frequent shopper's discount at wherever store he buys them from. I bet at that same store you could also find April O'Neil for shopping for her famous yellow jumpsuit there. <laughs> and just as Dick Tracy predicted, Blackjack robs the wholesome bank while playing Jumbo Bumba and sees Dick's ambush coming from a mile away. Blackjack walks into Dick Tracy's trap with eyes wide open and starts sending out the hostages. Except one. That's everyone except the bank president, Mr. Armstrong. Come on, old man, we don't have all night. You're new to my gang, Sherman, so pay attention. My number one rule is we don't touch the civilians. I honestly kind of think that Blackjack is stealing the spotlight for the whole storyline here. He's a bank robber, but he only steals from the corrupt or unpopular banks. And he makes it a very, very clear point to never harm anybody. He never even shoots police officers. He's a good enough shot, he just shoots the gun out of their hands. He's a major fan of a hugely successful, well-known cop and yet he becomes a bank robber. He really is an interesting character. I like him. So Blackjack calls out Dick, agreeing to let Wormsworth go if Dick comes in alone and unarmed. Dick agrees because that's exactly what a police officer would do. Dick Tracy, do you mind if I call you Dick? It's been an honor to finally meet you. I've been following your career my whole life. Blackjack, if, you're, if you've been following my career so closely, why are you a bank robber? Easy! You're such a good cop, you need an opposite number. And that's me! 
I'm sorry, Blackjack. I believe what you meant to say was, this city deserves a better classic criminal. <laughs> and I'm gonna give it to him. Blackjack's got his whole escape plan now, and he wants Dick there to witness his getaway. He and his goons use the steel cables that go from rooftop to rooftop as makeshift zip lines. And they would have gotten away with it too if Sam Catchem hadn't looked up right then. The zip lines drop them off at a pre-planned snowplow, which they used to get through the snowy streets easier than the police cars that are chasing them. That's actually pretty smart, yeah. Even though we last saw Dick Tracy handcuffed on an air conditioner unit on the roof of the bank, he managed to be the only police officer on Blackjack's tail, something which thrills Blackjack to no end. Okay, does anybody at all have any ideas how Dick managed to get up and catch up so quickly? Anyone? Anyone at all? No? Okay, moving on. And then, one of Blackjack's things starts to take a pot shot at Dick Tracy, and Blackjack actually throws him from the moving snowplow into the street to save Dick. Blackjack's actually protecting his nemesis. I love this film. This guy's great. Sadly for Blackjack, though, the chase ends with him getting penned in by trap. He's caught, and there's nowhere for him to escape to. Tracy, I'll give myself up if you do me a favor. What is it? What is Tracy doing? He's putting his hat on a fire hydrant. I like this comic in particular for a lot of reasons. I like that we don't actually see Dick Tracy putting his hat on the fire hydrant. It keeps it mysterious. It keeps it sort of interesting and up to your own imagination. Also, having a totally silent panel at the end draws so much attention to all the artwork, which is still, excuse me, which is still great. The bright colors, the look on Blackjack's face, it's all just a joy to look at. Blackjack then shoots the hat and immediately surrenders, saying that he wanted a space on Dick's famous wall of hats. Like, I never shoot you, you're my pal! And that more or less ends our story. We do get some post-action wrap-up where Blackjack says how much he's looking forward to breaking out and challenging Dick again. And we get to see the famous wall of hats, but that's pretty much it. And you know what? I really enjoyed it. This is the first zombie strip I've read that I actually liked. I said it. The artwork was good, the story was fun, the villain was absolutely fantastic and memorable, and I actually hope to see him again. I think that Blackjack's got a lot of potential as a villain who can slowly devolve into something meaner and darker as he tries to beat Dick Tracy. I doubt it'll ever happen in the mild and North Coast newspaper comics pages, but hey, you know what? A guy can dream. After all, I never thought I would find a zombie strip that I actually would like. Thank you for coming, and this is the end of the Punchline Live. All right, uh, I do have some time left, so the floor is open if any of you have any questions you want to ask. If you don't, I'm willing to go on a just mild discussion about things at random, and then if you want questions. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Why did Tracy? Uh, it's one of those famous comics that, uh, you know, even if you never really know it all that well, everybody's heard of it, at least, they know the yellow thing, they maybe you saw the Warm B movie and uh, Warm Betty movie in 1990. Um, they know the two-way wrist watch radio, which is something something else famous that Dick Tracy brought to the table. And it's also a comic that has a storyline, which is important, because some of the comics that I review don't have storylines, they just sort of meander and they ramble through. The storylines are fun because they're uh, a bit more fun to pick apart, and probably more fun here, so hence Dick Tracy. If I had done Flash Gordon earlier, I would have done Flash Gordon, which is also still a really good comic. They're not making new Flash Gordon comics anymore, but you can find old Flash Gordon comics online. They're actually still really, really good. The comics still amazing. So. Yeah. Oh, what's the worst comic you've ever read? Oh, let me think here. The worst comic I've ever read was probably one I just did a couple of episodes ago for my show. It was a comic called Mama. And here, yeah, M-O-M-M-A. And, um... It's written, here's the thing, the guy who writes it was the head of the National Cartoonist Society for back-to-back -back terms. He's been in the business since the 70s, and he's a certified member of Mensa. But, just from an objective standpoint, like, I'm never going to say that, that any particular artwork is, like, terrible, because everybody brings their own style, I don't say it's not sort of my thing, I don't, I'll say it doesn't change up that much, or it gets kind of still because they just reuse poses over and over again. Um, Garfield is the prime offender, recycled, copy-paste, and all work I hate. 
And Mama didn't copy paste any recycled articles, but it was all in black and white, which unless there's a deliberate purpose for it in 2013, you shouldn't do. And there's smudges everywhere. There's smudges all over the yard. And I'm think, and I just look at it and wonder, yeah, no, I'm serious. This is this guy's the head of the NCS, and he doesn't like erase his lines or make sure he doesn't thumb put thumb over his ink. And the humor is just terrible. It's not funny. It's just kind of mean spirited, and I didn't like it at all. Hey, you are next. Found the security. I'm just checking okay. on people. Yeah, sure. Um, found newspaper comments. If you got any questions, I'm gonna take the Q and A. So Mama was a bit worse than what I've read. Um, the angriest review I've ever done, though, was a funky linker bean storyline that ran in mid-November, where Tom Baddock, who's the cartoonist, just pretty much just looked at, looked at the. He said, "If you like uh, funny comics, and you're holding newspaper comics back as an art form." I just. I tore him to shreds over that one. It's my longest review, my angriest review. I admit my least funny because I was so angry, but uh, that was the maddest I've ever been. So. Do you like the fact that he's doing tributes right now to different classic yeah. artists? That's kind of interesting. Uh, right now, uh, Funky Baker Bean is doing like a Flash Gordon sort of spook storyline. He actually got Flash Gordon to cameo in his storyline. Which is sort of interesting, because Tom Baddock, I think, actually has the right idea that comics shouldn't just be funny, but he did, went about the totally wrong way. And adventure comics, like Dick Tracy, like Flash Gordon, like The Phantom, um, aren't really around anymore. Flash Gordon's kind of gone, which is sad. Um, so, looking at, you know, seeing him want to bring back adventure comics and, you know, bring some, some like, dramatic strips, it's interesting, and watching Tom like, kind of throw out a love letter like that is honestly kind of cool, so... It's... Yeah, it's, it's just kind of cool to see him bringing in Flash Gordon, with a pretty decent Flash Gordon look, too. He's not drawing Flash Gordon in the funky Anchorman style, he's drawing Flash Gordon in the Flash Gordon style, which is pretty cool. Any other questions? Anyone? Don't be shy. Okay. Um... If you'll indulge me, I'm just going to go. I have about 10 minutes left. Um, if, you ever, if you have a question, you can interrupt me. But um, I mentioned zombie strips earlier, and I just want to go on a little rant about those and why those don't necessarily work. Um, zombie strips, like in the worst possible form, are when somebody creates a cartoon, they do it for a while, and then they bring in, like in the worst cases, and it has happened before, they bring in their son or their daughter as an assistant, the two. Big ones I'm thinking of are Hagen, the Horrible, BC, and the Wizard of Id right now. They bring in their sons or their daughters, and then when the original cartoonist retires or dies, the son, the, the, the child, continues the work just right from there. And yeah, some of you out there are, look, are looking at me going, seriously, they do that? And yeah, they do it. And the reason why it doesn't work is uh, the original cartoonist has a certain sort of voice and a sort, sort of flavor that they bring to a comic. And it's very rare that someone can continue that same kind of voice um, over and over again. And it's different from comic books. This is an important distinction to make. Comic books, you know, Spider-Man, Superman, Batman, they get new new writers, new cartoonists all the time. That's because everybody has different stories to tell. They bring new ideas to the table. It's sort of a concrete archetype in there. In part because comic books can be more complex it's because they're not limited to three panels. So it's, uh, it's good to bring in fresh blood that because there's new ideas that are constantly cycling through that can be to get fleshed out. With three comics, there's not as much space to really delve in unless you've got one guy who goes with it over a long period of time, like or Charles Schultz, the Peanuts, or like Bill Watterson did with the Calvin Hobbes, which is probably the greatest comic ever made. Um, it's, it's like a TV show that goes on for, for too long. The characters just sort of devolve into walking stereotypes and parodies. Family Circus is another big one, because those kids actually used to get in trouble a lot. They were real troublemakers, and the parents would threaten them, like threaten them with spankings and threaten them with belt lashings. And I'm not saying that that's necessarily funny, I don't know, I haven't seen those strips, but you know, it's at least more interesting than what they do now, which is kid makes keep a main observation. And the other reason that it really, really bugs me is Eventually it gets around for so, sticks around for so long that there sort of comes a point when nobody wants to get rid of it. Because do you really want to be the guy who says, well, I want to cancel the 75-year-old strip uh, that every, that's, that's been around for years and everybody you know, reads in, in risk of an unknown. And the thing is, yeah, there's unknowns, but there's really, really, really good unknowns that deserve a spot. 
Uh, so, for those of you who haven't seen it, the best comic I ever read in 2012 was a pretty new strip that came out in 2006 by the name of Retail. But Dilbert is for corporate workers, Retail is for retail workers, and it's amazing. It runs in 70 newspapers. That strip, Mama, runs in 400. And I just kind of blew my mind, and that's the thing. When a strip zombifies, it like sort of locks up the chance for a new talent to be brought in, because how do you know? It's like nobody will read new strips. Well, how do you know? Because there's nobody out there reading them. Is there anybody carrying them? No. Well, because nobody's giving them a chance. And with the changing world of web comics going online and things like that happening, it might change over time. Don't know how. Don't know if it'll uh, happen quick enough to be, you know, drastically change the landscape. But you know, God can help. Um, is that a question? We you? are a web. We're from a web comic. Oh really? We're from Homestead. Really? Yeah. Nice. Dave, Trickster John of John. <laughs> Congratulations and thank you for coming. Yeah. And I feel terrible because I don't believe really we home stuff. <laughs> it's real and it's gonna end next month. What? It's ending next month. Oh, well, it's gonna be a rough start, but okay. okay. Yeah, you have to It's hard to start it in there else. <laughs> That's fine with me. I've read Sluggy Freelance three times. It is an adventure. It's really good. Okay. I don't know what's happening, so. Alright, well, I'll check it out. Uh, thank you for coming. Yeah. I, My mom read me. I really? Yeah. That's cool. Well, like, Calvin Hobbes, mm. Garfield, Dick Tracy, mm. and I had all the comic books, like, all my. Mom's old comic books. I have like those big zipper plastic bags okay. at her house, just full. So nice. And actually, they. <laughs> well, thank you all for coming. I think that's about all the time I have. So thank you, Anna Marathon. Yes. Woo!